Welcome to the third webinar on uh, uh, national bioinformatics communities in Elixir. So this joint event between Elixir and the Romanian Society of Bioinformatics. Um, this is the third and final event in the series of webinars. And in this one, we're looking in more detail at the collaboration opportunities for plant sciences. So let me just explain the agenda for today and introduce some of our speakers because we've got quite a lot of talks and there'll be a lot of information presented to you. So in a moment, I'll give you a very short introduction to Elixir um, for those of you who weren't able to join the very first meeting. Um, and then Christina Gruden, who is the co-lead of Elixir's plant science community and represents Elixir Slovenia, will talk to you both about the Elixir wide plant science activities and also give you some examples of the services that Elixir Slovenia runs in the area of plants. Then Cyril Pommier, who is also a co-lead of the Elixir plant science community and representing Elixir France. He will talk to you more about some of the tools and specifically the standards that have been developed within Elixir for um, plant science data. We'll then have a short break before Celia and Daniel from Elixir Portugal will talk to you more about the national plant science activities in Portugal because it's a big theme for, for their node and also present the use case in the Elixir Converge project uh, where we're developing a research data management toolkit that would be useful for plant scientists as well. And then finally, and Dragos and Mihai will give a national presentation about um, exploring genetic diversity in forest and crop species in Romania using high throughput sequencing technologies. So you can get a good idea about some of the local activities that are taking place. After each presentation, there'll be time for a question. And then there'll also be time for questions and answers at the end of the event as well. All of the slides are available on the link. And if you want to review the recordings from the first two sessions, they're also now available online as well. So just to very quickly before we start the, the um, seminar proper, um, I wanted to just introduce you to Elixir Europe for those of you who didn't join the first session. Well, Elixir is an intergovernmental organization that aims to coordinate, integrate and sustain life science resources across Europe. They include databases, so resources where you can deposit data, but also resources where you can get um, data from as well, so knowledge bases. It includes software and analysis tools and workflows that you can use for your research. It includes training courses and materials, online training materials that you can access. Um, it includes resources that make your data interoperable and fair and standards as well, as well as national computing facilities that you can access. And also through the Converge project, which I mentioned, it includes support for local data management as well. So there are hundreds and hundreds of different databases, tools and interoperability resources across Elixir. And obviously in this talk, what in, in this session, we're just going to be focusing on the plant science specific ones from a certain number of Elixir nodes as well. And the idea of Elixir is to try and coordinate all of these services so that they form um, a single coordinated infrastructure to store life science research data. Um, we are a membership based organization. And so the countries that you see on the left of this slide are members of Elixir and Cyprus as an observer. And that means that they can take part fully in the activities and get funding from Elixir to do so. And then when they join, they create an Elixir node and you will hear more about Slovenia, Portugal, um, and you've heard from other nodes um, in, in, in previous talks as well. And that's really what we would like to try and do to give information about how Elixir nodes are structured so that over time, if Romania decides to become a member of Elixir, you know about how to go about setting up the node to take advantage of the opportunities that Elixir presents. But at the same time, the talks that you'll hear today will tell you about the opportunities for collaboration, even if Romania isn't a, isn't a member of Slovenia, um, isn't a member of Elixir as well. And so you'll hear about some of the plant science communities in Elixir. Um, we structure our activities around five platforms and then many domain specific communities as well. And so that's how we implement our work. That's how we fund projects through these areas. And you'll hear from the leads of the Elixir plant science communities through the following talks. So that's all I really wanted to say to introduce Elixir. And I'm going to stop now. I'll ask Christina if you can um, 
show your slides, please, and then give your presentation on Elixir's plant science activities. Thank you. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, so I, my talk will be structured um, in two. First, I would like to give you the overview of plant community activities in general, uh, being a co-lead with uh, Cyril Pomier and Astrid Juncker, and John Hancock is uh, our um, assistant from the Elixir Hub uh, and giving us a lot of support. And then in the second part, I will present you the, the services that we offer to plant science community uh, at Elixir Slovenia Note. So first, this first part. Um, so here I have some structure. I would like to show you uh, how we uh, organized our roadmap that is supposed to uh, last till uh, for next four years, till 2023. Uh, then I will talk about some uh, ongoing developmental activities within plant community. Uh, I would like to show you some examples of implement implementation studies that were where the plant community was participating or is participating and how we can support um, the research uh, on the national or EU level. And I would like also to show you some of the training activities that are performed within plant uh, science communities, co community, because these are then available to everybody. Okay, so first to the roadmap. Um, so the the objective is to really identify the existing gaps in, in plant science uh, data analysis or data sciences and then develop the tools and especially to ease the, the use of tools that are already existing. Uh, we would also like to support the data management implementation for plant sciences and to also help in training and uh, capacity building. Um, we have organized our activities uh, along the data life cycle, so it's a little bit easier for everybody to, to understand uh, uh, what uh, we are planning to do. And besides the tasks uh, where we are tackling some of the issue uh, of this uh, data processing, for example, Hopefully you can see my mouse data integration analysis and visualization and so on. We also organize the use cases. So kind of uh, examples on uh, or showcase uh, to showcase the scientists on how to handle their data sets along the life cycle, their life cycle. So for example, we will have, this is still in preparation, a use case on how to find the data sets that you would like to have in your analysis, how to handle the data collection and pre-processing, how to analyze and visualize tools uh, using uh, interoperability and workflows uh, approaches, um, how to uh, make your data publicly available, um, and so on. We also compile the list of tools that are available for plant scientists because we realize that this is not so easy to access. Uh, so, and we have also organized them to help the, the users again along the data life cycle. So you have it listed here, but we also organized a simple table. Uh, you have a link here of tools uh, where you have the, um, the brief description of the tool, its use, the link to the to the to the tool, and the uh, the developers' uh, contact. So this is also maybe useful for you. And then I would like to uh, expose a couple of uh, ongoing developmental activities. Uh, the first one is development of standards. Uh, we were quite engaged in the past uh, with the development of the minimal information about plant phenotyping experiment standards, so so-called MyEpi. Now we have the version two out uh, and also published. We also have some use cases available for the emphasis data sets. So emphasis is an infrastructure for plant phenotyping. And it's also implemented in another um, uh, tool that we developed uh, called uh, BRAPI, uh, Breeding API. 
which is an interface for plant breeding applications and it helps linking, uh, linking them. I think you will hear more about that in the next talk. As you will hear about uh, our uh, plant data search service called FEDER, uh, where we have um, genotype and phenotype uh, data linked and uh, findable now. Uh, genotype data are organized in the centralized uh, repository at the Elixir Hub and the phenotype data are uh, distributed along different nodes actually of uh, Elixir. And then you have an interface that is allowing uh, the search through, through the whole uh, system of repositories. Another perhaps interesting tool that is also part of uh, Elixir is the European Search Catalog for Plant Genetic Resources, uh, which harbors um, really many accessions. Um, so here you have a, um, an outline of, of a um, number of accessions per genus, and you see that there are many for, uh, available for Arabidopsis, but also for some very important agricultural uh, crops like uh, uh, wheat or barley, maize. Uh, so it's a uh, very important resource for plant sciences and we would like it to become Elixir core resource. Another interesting tool existing in El Elixir uh, are implementation studies. Perhaps you have already heard about that from previous seminars, um, but just to briefly explain again. So these are small projects that are aiming at getting specific tasks done in collaboration of multiple nodes within Elixir and also including uh, several platforms. Um, so for example, here we have some of the finished ones that where the plant sciences were involved. And this one was maybe the most uh, plant science oriented and we were trying to, or testing the, oops, sorry, uh, testing how the, Apple genomic data can be deposited into uh, public databases. It was not so trivial as it sounds now. So uh, we identified quite some problems and then within plant sciences, we can also try to find solutions. And, uh, and so there is also an implementation study that is ongoing now uh, uh, within Portuguese uh, note. Uh, collaboration between the, the academic and uh, industry uh, partners. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more from our Portuguese uh, lecturers today. And another one that is helping in uh, making the plant genotyping data fair and linking them to phenotyping data. So just that you have an idea of what you can get from um, Elixir plant community, but that's uh, I think when you would be a full member. Uh, we are also trying to uh, be internationally linked. Uh, some of our uh, partners of the nodes have also international outposts, and that's how we got uh, also the several BRAPI uh, implementations worldwide uh, through the CGER center. And also we are strongly involved in uh, development of crop ontology that is also an international activity and was started by the same institute. Uh, we are also offering support to EU and national projects. And here there is a list of the some that just started like this summer. Um, and it seems it's uh, an important part of uh, of these projects uh, and it helps them get financed. And we are also having tight interactions with other European infrastructures, uh, mainly with emphasis. This is really, really tight uh, for plant phenotyping, but also we had st have started some discussions um, with Eurobioimaging for plant microscopy. And in EOS Clive, uh, we are running a demonstrator that is linking also um, ISBI, that is the uh, infrastructure for systems biology. Okay, this is also very important. So uh, we are involved in quite some training activities. Uh, for example, the implementation uh, manual for uh, 
for my EPI standard is already deposited on TESS. So TESS is the, the Elixir portal for training. Uh, and then there are also some uh, more local uh, training materials available. For example, there is quite some uh, material posted and it was organized in uh, at the journal node um, of Elixir. And there, there were also some activities um, at Elixir France in that direction. And um, there is a biohackathon organized uh, in November 2020, where also some of the plant, uh, um, plant themes or problems will be addressed. OK, and uh, this is also an important part uh, of plant community, so we have regular teleconferences uh, where we give overview of activities in different nodes uh, and try to then harmonize them, coordinate, uh, work together. And we also try to identify different gaps and discuss how to tackle them. So it's um, now there are quite some uh, participants attending normally. And uh, it also the information also travels the other way around. So we get uh, the information on what is going on in general in Elixir um, on those meetings. Uh, and then we also have yearly face-to-face -face meeting at Elixir All Hands. We have a session, uh, at least uh, yeah, um, <laughs> before the COVID situation. This was so, and we will see how it goes in the future. So this was it for the for the overview of plant community activities. And now I would like to show you some how um, some of our um, services uh, at Elixir Slovenia are organized. So they are um, aiming at multi-omics data integration. And I will focus on three. So just first to define what, what we mean with uh, multi-level integrative analysis. So most of biologists would like to understand how the cell of their interest is working. And they would like to study it on different levels from the DNA to the transcripts, proteins, uh, uh, metabolites, small RNAs. So these are then what we call multi-level analysis. And at the end, of course, you would not like to have every molecular level separated. Um, you would like to have kind of an integrated view of what is going on in the in the cell. And uh, how to approach it. So at least in our hands, uh, the it has proven the easiest to do the late data integration. So to normalize and uh, do the statistical analysis on separate data sets and then integrate them through biological knowledge. So the first option is to link them to ontologies. Uh, and the second that uh, we also offer tools for is uh, to link them to knowledge networks. And let's first see how, to, how it goes with the ontologies. So with the functional ontologies, you can go from individual components of your system. So for example, if you measure transcripts of, or metabolites uh, to the level of biological processes. So we, instead of st studying individual genes, here you can see that, for example, pyruvate metabolism is down-regulated and uh, surfer uh, relay system is up-regulated. And so it's a little bit higher level uh, view of your data. And there are several ontologies available for that. The most uh, widely uh, used and accepted is the gene ontology. But we also have CAP, CAC, BioSeq, and MAPMAN. And I would like to tell you a bit more about MAPMAN. Because um, uh, uh, MAPMAN was really specifically designed for plants. And I will show you that that's why it can work in some cases better than gene ontology. Uh, and through the, it was this was done through really manual uh, annotation of genes to different functions. So the processes are here called bins. So the, at the first level, we have uh, genes functions organized into 34 bins, and the last one, the 35, is the the genes with unknown function are 
output here. And just now we are in the process of reorganization to version four of Mapman ontology and slightly uh, differently organized at the first level, but um, the principle still stays the same. And what you need then to, uh, to help with the, uh, with the visualization of data in your, on the level of biological processes. So the pathway diagrams, like the one you see here, where you have the overview of the uh, primary metabolism, so different uh, carbohydrates, uh, metabolism, synthesis, and degradation, uh, so TCA cycle, glycolysis, photosynthesis, secondary metabolism. Uh, so this is called pathway diagram. And then you have ontology mapping. So this mapping, maps certain gene to certain beans. So this is then one bean, for example, here we have light reaction and the genes are mapped into these beans. And then the third thing is your experimental data. And then, then you, you can get your uh, genes colored according to the, to the, um, to the upregulation or downregulation observed in your experimental system. So the red, for example, here is upregulation. So it seems that amino acid synthesis was upregulated and photosynthesis was downregulated because it's green. So what is the difference between Mapman ontology and gene ontology? So they're slightly differently organized. You have the acyclic directed graph for gene ontology and uh, hierarchical tree for Mapman. Um, and also, um, the, I, I think I forgot to tell before, but uh, the gene ontology is um, organized on the three different levels. So biological process, molecular function, and uh, localization. And Mapman uh, has two of those kind of linked together into one hierarchical tree, the uh, biological process and molecular function but the, the localization is excluded from Mapman. And when they compar compared um, what is the information content of both ontologies, they realized that for some things, of course, for example, see here is the, the overlap between both is quite high. So majority of the genes with known function in Arabidopsis uh, have similar assignment in both gene ontology and Mapman ontology. There are some genes that are better assigned in either gene ontology molecular function or gene ontology biological process, but there are also quite some that are uniquely assigned with a function within Mapman. Um, so in, at least in practice for us, on you know, our data set, uh, Mapman worked much better, but it's true that also both ontologies are improving a lot and also gene ontology got better from 2012. Um, and then the GUMAPMAN is the database where all these gene notations are compiled. So you can easily browse and see which genes belong to, to each of the processes. For example, here you have the TCA cycle and you see then you have different species in organized through orthologs. Uh, and you can see that, for example, this uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, here you have two, um, two, para, two uh, paralux uh, within one species, both for Arabidopsis tatiana, for potato, for rice, and for um, tomato. Uh, when you click on one of the genes, you get some additional information, so it's quite practical. If you want to, to know a bit more about your gene of interest, so you have link to also to gene ontology, so you can uh, quickly trance check how it's your gene doing in gene ontology. And then you have some other annotations in. Um, currently there are 13 species included in GOMAPMAN, uh, but uh, it's constantly updating. So I think we now have also peach in that is still not listed here. Um, and what is also very important is the export functions in Mapman. For example, here you have the, uh, all the mappings that are needed for Mapman application, but you also have the, uh, 
the mapping exports required for, for example, for GeneScent enrichment uh, tool for Biomine that we will uh, hear about a bit later on. And uh, also we have some generic exports so you can use them in any other tool you wish. Uh, but we said that we will talk about multi-level integrative analysis and also here um, Go Mapman can help a lot together with the visualization in Mapman. So we now have three separate um, mappings. We have mappings for uh, coding genes. So we called it uh, protein Go Mapman. We have a mapping for metabolites and we have a mapping for small RNAs. So small RNAs are mapped based on their uh, the function of their target mRNA. So we can see which processes might be affected when the small RNAs are, are upregulated or downregulated. Uh, so how we can then see that in Mapman? Uh, so you can see max two levels in parallel. So you can have either protein data, transcript data, small RNA data and metabolites. Because here, for example, you have the, um, the con this is an example of TCA cycle. And for the conversion of isocitrate into oxaglutamate, uh, you have six parallel genes um, working um, or able to perform this function. Uh, and you can see that just one of them was regulated. And here you also have the information on uh, what was going on with the metabolite. And here, for example, with glutamate and oxoglutamate here. Um, otherwise, you can just uh, visualize like one level. Here is the example of small RNAs um, that are assigned to beans based on their targets, as I explained before. If you want to visualize more than two levels at once, then uh, we have the, developed the tool with Spanish uh, collaborators called paint omics, but I don't have it presented in detail here now. And or you can also use cytoscape. Okay, and then how to link our experimental data sets to knowledge networks. So we have constructed two types of knowledge network. The first one we called comprehensive knowledge network and we linked dispersed knowledge sources available in uh, different databases and also in supplements of different uh, manuscripts and they are covering uh, the, the knowledge network covers the metabolic pathways from KEC, different sources for protein protein interactions and for uh, transcriptional regulation. Uh, and we also included the MIRNA regulatory network. So at the moment for the Arabidopsis, we have 20,000 nodes uh, included and uh, 70,000 connections between them. So it's quite large network and it's, it can really gives you some insights that you wouldn't see otherwise in your data. And then we also had the reverse, a more detailed approach, so-called bottom-up, uh, where we just uh, focused on the immune signaling uh, in plants, and we were really digging into the literature and compiling the reactions between different components in a very exact man manner. So it's also possible to do uh, dynamic modeling with this model. And here we have much smaller system, but very accurate, so no no false positives here, uh, and we uh, so it's now uh, composed of a little bit less than 200 components. And we included this background knowledge in the uh, tool we named Dinar. Um, it has different um, apps attached that are. Uh, um, that can that are available for pre-processing and for clustering if you have your uh, background knowledge network that is too large for example if you have 20,000 nodes you cannot visualize that in just one screen so we do pre-clustering and then you can inspect individual clusters one by one um, so you have we, we imported that and then um, and you just uh, add your experimental data. And your experimental data can be of 
any type, so describing any molecular level from transcriptomics, uh, myrnaomics, metabolomics, proteomics, epigenomics. The only important thing is that IDs in your data match the IDs that are in the network. So you can import your own network or you can use the, the networks that are already there. And of course, it's really great if you can have the uh, for the inspection of time series, but it can be also used for uh, inspection of changes that occur in different um, multiple conditions. Uh, so you have static visualization of your uh, of networks with, with the um, expression of with the experimental data plotted. You have the dynamic visualizations. I will show you some example. What is also important is the exports. So of course you can export your results, but also the analysis settings uh, are exported, which allows for the reproducibility of the results, and it's in accordance of with fair. Um, tools, um, uh, standards, uh, it can be run locally or uh, interactively within the uh, Shiny app. So here I will just show you. So first some this uh, static uh, uh, views of the dinar. So you have to choose the cluster. And for example, if and then you have different conditions or time points and you can move, you can change this and you move through the conditions or time through the static interaction network, or you can use the dynamic visualization, which is much nicer. So here you can really see which part is then changing and you can link that uh, change that you notice to a certain part of the of the metabolism or signaling um, in the cell. It has proven really uh, to work really nicely for generation of novel hypotheses of what is going on in your, in your experimental system. Uh, this is then the smaller model, the immune signaling model, and we can do similarly here. Um, you can also get the dynamic visualization so these notes, just to remind you, can be anything, can be metabolites, um, genes, proteins, uh, small RNAs, and uh, you get the edge um, colored when they are both differentially uh, expressed in your data, ex expressed or uh, present or whatever you would call it for different data sets. OK, and the last tool I would like to show you, it's uh, plant biomine, where we have the same knowledge database uh, that I uh, explained before behind. So the comprehensive knowledge networks and also some um, other. Uh, and you have the link discovery function implemented. So you can find some novel connections between two of you, uh, the genes you're really interested in. So you just put them here select here the database plants because it's also available for humans and mice. Uh, and then you, you get a very nice interactive uh, network. And here, for example, we could see that uh, there are two transcription factors in between the, uh, the our genes of interest. So here I, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people that contributed also to development of these tools and also the, the maintenance. Um, and you see that, um, so the GOMAPMAN was developed together with the German uh, note for, uh, of Elixir. Uh, DINAR was developed only by Slovenian note. And so this, if you want to go to multi-level, I said uh, experiments, so more than two levels, then you can use Paintomics. This was de developed with CONISA's lab uh, in Spain. And the plant biomine was again developed within Slovenian a note of Elixir together with uh, uh, collaborators from another institute, uh, Josef Stefan Institute. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christina. That was a really, a really nice talk, an introduction to a lot of work that's taking place across Elixir and in Slovenia as well. So we'll take one or two questions here. So I can't see any questions that have been written down in the Q&A.
but I can remind people that if they want to ask a question uh, by raising their hand, then they can do that. And at the same time, in the chat, there have been two questions that have been posted in chat. So I'm going to read those out to you now, Christina. The first one is from Ramona. And that is a question. Um, she would be interested in knowing if there is a database available with plant genome and nutrition or health issues. So nutrigenomics based on plant genomics data. And so maybe you know that. And also if John is on the line, um, he can maybe comment about Elixir's activities in food and nutrition as well. So maybe both of you could, could answer that if possible. Mm. So I'm not aware of any specific database uh, that would be focused on that. Um, that. Well, there are some, as you have seen, about um, genetic resources, which, which would also include probably the plants that um, uh, you would be interested in, and some general ones, of course, like uh, uh, so the EBI tools. Um, but nothing really specific. So maybe really John would know better. Okay, John. Yeah, I mean, I don't, oh, let me just show myself. Um, I don't know specifically about the database for this, but I, um, I would like to tell you a bit about the Elixir communities and also uh, a community that's being set up at the moment. So there's a new community being established within Elixir um, on food and nutrition. And of course, the aim of anything within Elixir is uh, data infrastructure, and this is the kind of thing that a community like that would deal with. Um, communities in Elixir are open to people outside Elixir, so if people in, from Romania would like to participate in discussions as the community evolves further, that's a possibility. Or that it, you can't obviously receive funding, but you can participate in discussions. So I think that's the kind of thing that a, a community uh, in food and nutrition could deal with and possibly build uh, based on what's available currently. Excellent. Many thanks, John, for answering that. Um, we can, if it's okay, we can post your email address in the chat so that people can contact you if they want more information about the food and nutrition. Yes, sir. Um, or if there's a, yeah, we, we'll, we'll do that. Um, we have another question. I'm going to take one more because for time, we're okay at the moment. So this is a question question to Christina, but maybe others on the panel like Cyril might have an opinion as well. So the question um, is from Bogdan and he notes that there's a difference with human data here. So plant data doesn't typically, doesn't uh, raise privacy issues. On the other hand, commercial restrictions are more significant. So how does the Plant Data Federation work with the loss of the commercial advantage implied by the data sharing? That's more for Cyril, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there are indeed several um, projects in which uh, we are involved in France between in involving both uh, private partners and public partners. To avoid uh, the problem that you are pointing, the, lot of, the loss of um, advantage, of uh, strategic advantage, what the private partners are doing is that on one hand, they are sharing um, scientific facts, scientific research on uh, public known uh, varieties of their plant of interest but they are keeping very uh, secretly the work on their uh, elite lines, um, what they want to use as uh, plant material for commercial purpose. In other words, the um, collaboration between private and public is mainly on the process and the, um, on the theoretical knowledge around plant science and the application on elite lines is done solely by private sector and separately. Excellent, thank you. I think one thing that I would add here as well, um, and we can post the link to this in the chat, is that in Elixir, we do have an industry program. And one of the things we do is collect connect experts from Elixir nodes with companies that generate data or use the data. And Elixir France is hosting the next um, innovation and SME forum, and it's on the theme of plant sciences. So that would have been a face-to-face -face meeting in Lyon, 
hosted by Bayer Crop Sciences, but we're likely to move that to a virtual event and it will be open to anyone, including companies and researchers in Romania. So we'll share some details of that in the Slack channel for anyone who's interested in um, building links with Elixir experts and industry in the area of plant sciences. So this is also a good segue um, to you, Cyril, if you can now um, give us uh, your uh, upload your slide, please, and give us your introduction to um, the tools and standards that, uh, that, that are being developed in, in Elixir's plant science infrastructure. Thank you. Okay, so I've uploaded already my slides. Um, just I've done a last minute update to try to avoid as much as possible the redundancies with the presentation from my colleagues, Christina and uh, Daniel and Celia. Uh, so anyway, let's begin this with first a quickly second overview of what the plant community is doing with a higher focus on tool standards and infrastructures, how we are using it and how we are trying to promote it, both from a Com, uh, community wide point of view and from the Elixir France point of view. So, historically, our community has been built to uh, based on the motivation that we need to increase the sustainability of plant production. Uh, so, it aligns very well with the question we have just discussed. We know that there is climate change going on, we know that the United Nations. Uh, sustainable development goals are mainly on mo uh, a lot focused on agriculture. Therefore, the plant community works both on crop and forest. It works in integrating and linking phenotype, genotype, environment, genetic resources, literature, and omics. And in that respect, the questions that we have just discussed uh, around the link between genomic data and food and health and nutrition data is related to this kind of problematic. And among the objective, beyond this linking between different data sets, we want also to work on genetic and genomic and extend this to system biology. This is what Slovenian uh, Nod has just presented now. And the idea is, of course, to promote, to construct the tools, the databases, the standards for plant research, to avoid redundancy, and to uh, encourage collaboration around common tools and objectives. So it's uh, focused around plant production between the genome, the environment, the phenom. And it's around fair. I assume that most people know about that concept, which is about giving making the data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable to allow plant breedings and climate change studies, for instance. A quick overview of uh, the plant community. So first, there are a lot of nodes uh, from all over Europe, but the interest is also that we are strongly connected outside of Europe, and we've got connection with a global landscape with most uh, European plant institutes first, but also with collaboration with the CGIR, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. Uh, we have a strong connection with plant genetic resources communities, the FAO of the United Nations, Eurisco that has been mentioned, uh, project, H2020 project around genetic resources. This is simply because when we want to um, select the right varieties for a given uh, climatic uh, scenario, for instance, you need a strong uh, collaboration with plant genetic resources communities. And also we've got a very strong connection with the emphasis plant phenotyping European infrastructure uh, around especially, of course, uh, plant phenotyping data management. So within the roadmap that Christina presented us, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, mainly the two first objectives 
which is building a sustainable tool federation and allow fair data management. So connection to analysis capabilities for plant science is something that is being built a little bit on the background for now, but since we've got colleagues that are involved in the galaxy community, it's going to fall in place rather nicely. So in the data life cycle that have been presented, uh, I will focus first on how to find relevant data sets on the data collection, most uh, on the less on the data processing and also on the data publication. Therefore, it's going to be about, about several tools. So the data standards, is that a Myapi crop ontology, the data integration tools like SIC and a data findability tool like FEDER, Breeding API and data repositories like GMPIS, IDAR and Fairdom Hub. So about the data standards that backs the capabilities of data publication. What I would like to point as a general overview is that to enable a fair data publication, we need three types of data standards. The first one is about semantic. It's about the way you describe your data. It's about building control vocabularies like the gene ontology or the GoMapan that has been just presented. And either control vocabularies or ontologies which bring semantic links between terms. The important thing here is that it's a process that is mainly biologist driven. On the other hand, we've got structure standards, which is about formatting and organizing the data. It's about building data models. It's about building standards such as CSV, VCF, GFF, MyAPIs that I will describe right after. And here we need both the input of biologists and computer scientists. And finally, you've got technical standards, which provide means of data integration of sharing, which provide interoperability between tools and system. And those are things like GA for GH for um, gen genotyping data or the breeding APIs that I will quickly discuss. So later of, of, are of course mainly computer scientists driven. So about the phenotype semantic standards, the ontologies, uh, the main one we are working on are the crop ontologies. It's a framework, a way to describe what you are observing, what you are uh, measuring either in the field or in the greenhouse through a triplet made of a trait, a method and a scale. And we've got several ontologies available for different species. We've got also the phenotype stricter standards, the minimal information about plant phenotyping experiment. It's available through myapi.org. It has been built between Elixir and FASIS Biodiversity and North American Plant Phenotyping Network. It's an open community and it addresses the needs of experiment on crops and woody plants. Uh, it is both computer scientist friendly with an explicit data model, is a tools and breeding API uh, compatible. It has validation framework toolbox and it has a semantic representation. And the best advance in this new version of my API is probably the focus we have put on making it biologist friendly. We wanted to build clear definitions and example. We wanted to have a good organization that reflect the way biologists, experimental people think, how they organize the data. Therefore, we've got Excel templates and we provide a lot of, of trainings on the best way to use and understand MyAPI. And last, MyAPI, it's mainly a specification and it has multiple implementations. The file archive through Isatab, semantic through the plant phenotyping experiment ontologies that I've just mentioned, and the web service through the breeding API. 
You can find more uh, information regarding this publication in the Papa Gotslu and all uh, papers that has been published this year in the New Fetologist. To give you a quick idea of how it works and uh, how it is constructed, an example here, you've got a set of fields, an experimental network in which you have different data files taken from each of the fields. It is organized in this way through the ESA backbone. ESA standing for investigation study assay. Investigation is the whole data set. The study is one experiment in one location. The assay is the level, the trade, the method. In other words, it's a crop ontology. And last but not least, you've got the biological material uh, which provide both identification and description. It is therefore very uh, easy for biologists through one hour of training to get the grasp of this approach. Finally, a quick overview of phenotype technical standards, the BRAPI available through BRAPI.org. It's another international collaboration which provide an open web service API, an implementation of my API, you've got the same concept with a main target about breeding, of course. It has been initiated by the excellence in breeding platform of the CGIR and Elixir people have strongly contributed to this. And there are several tools all over the world that currently implement the breeding API. Moreover, we uh, mentioned the effort of Elixir toward industry. There are Elixir knowledge exchange scheme targeting uh, the phenospecs, a uh, plant phenotyping uh, company, uh, and to, to bring them uh, more insight on the best way to use a breeding API. What we are building more and more is training. <clears throat> around those data standards. There are several nodes that are currently proposing training uh, around uh, MyAPI. All the, plan the material is accessible on TERS. So if you go there, you, find, you search for MyAPI, you will find this with the link to the material hosted on GitHub. So the second thing is about data findability. First question is of course, why would we need a federated plant data portal? The assumption between this is that the data repositories are currently highly dispersed and will remain dispersed. We've got data at EBI, of course, but it's not centralizing everything. We've got data in France, in Germany, in US, in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is to have a one-stop portal that allows to find the data and to link back to the source repositories. It's not a submission portal, it's not a centralized database for the data. So it provides a very simple uh, approach for data finding to uh, be able to cope with the heterogeneity of the different data repositories with a full text search in which you can put whatever uh, uh, keyword you want in this uh, search box. To be able to refine your search, you have a series of facets through uh, species, databases, data provider, etc. And finally, the strongest approach, the strongest uh, point of this data discovery approach, which is currently uh, proposed for Elixir, but also or mainly for the WIT IS, is the diversity of data types it allows to handle. And as I said, it provides link back to uh, the original uh, data repositories, for instance, here, Canet Miner or Ensemble Plant. So we've got a first simple approach, which allows to provide a generic or community specific portal. It is totally open source, available on GitHub, and it can be very easily customized for different flavor. As I said, there is the uh, Elixir one, and we've got also the WIT IS from the WIT initiative from the G20 that has its own, its own portal. 
as well as RAR, which is a plant genetic resource uh, portal for uh, France. But in Elixir, we wanted to go one step beyond. Indeed, we have built very good data standards and the strength of uh, this uh, of those data standards was to, to bring uh, more finer search capabilities. Therefore, we have built on the existing success of the WITIS and the generic data repositories that, uh, data portal that I just presented you. And we have built on this to bring a BRAPI, breeding API based search capabilities to provide findability link back and in the future download, download on link to analysis. So distributed model, once again, to share the cost of data storage and heterogeneity. And furthermore, it's global and goes beyond Elixir. So this Elixir plant data search service named Feder uh, is currently indexing phenomics data sets from uh, different genomic databases, GMPIS in France, IDAL in uh, Germany, both being under the umbrella of emphasis, PIPA in uh, Belgium, etc. And the interest is that it brings a very strong connection to genetics and genomics data available at EBI, both through the breeding API and through this portal available at this URL. And what we are going to do is to merge the generic lightweight lightweight approach that I've just presented you with Feder to bring both literature search and any bioschema source search. Furthermore, Feder provides data preview capabilities with Jump Plus genetic resources like for this one, as well as for phenotyping studies and genotyping studies like here for a preview of uh, EMBL uh, data. And of course, the most important is that it provides a link back to any database. So the take home message around those data portal federation is that if you want to bring one data federation or if you want to join an existing one, you can simply contact us through the plant community you can join either the generic lightweight approach, or if you want something more precise, more powerful, you can build your own BRAPI endpoint. Uh, we provide support. There is a validation tools named Brava, and uh, you've got easier approach for messages and extraction, which are possible. And finally, if you want, you can create your own community and create your own favor of the data discovery portal. Finally, uh, to address the data publication uh, problem, I want to speak about data toolboxes. This is an activity we have initiated some years ago now in the Elixir plant uh, community. And we want to build biologist friendly toolbox for data formatting and documenting. Once again, we have observed for years that we've got very good standards, but if building the standard files is too complicated for biologists, and if biologists need absolutely to work closely with computer scientists, it's way too long and way too difficult. Therefore, several initiatives have been uh, initiated to address this need through Sig for Science, Fairdom, possibly Corpo, PISA, Dataverse portals in France or in Portugal, and Emphasis databases. And what we are doing in Elixir is to build workflows for data publication in archives and databases, and mainly, of course, core data resources databases from Elixir. And we provide also recommendation and trainings. Because we like to be consistent, the workflow we are building is shown here in which you've got the uh, data publication toolboxes. These are tools, SIG, etc., that prepare data for submission in phenomics or genotyping databases. And all of those data are then linked together, integrated using feeders that I just presented you. 
The important thing behind those toolboxes is that they are all MyAPI and ISA based. ISA, as I said, is about uh, organizing the data through investigation study and assay. Uh, and ISA is a data standards backbone of many standards. So I've talked about it uh, for MyAPI, but it's used also for metabolomics, for proteomics, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Among the three uh, toolbox tools that I've uh, spoke about to prepare data submission, the first one, FairDOM or Seek for Science, it's a web interface for easy data organizing and formatting. The interesting thing is that it's very easy to instance it in your own laboratory. Therefore, you can very easily have a data management with access right for project for organization. It's great to organize confidential data. Furthermore, we are adding in Fairdom, my API guidance with study experiment description, including the localization, the experimental designs, things like that. And more important, a full plant material description. Uh, indeed, we have seen that to enable integration of the data, it's very important, of course, to be able to correctly identify both your sample and your plant material. So this is rather lightweight, but it doesn't serve all the purposes. PISA, uh, developed in uh, Slovenia, address other uh, purposes. And it is, for instance, very interesting for pipeline output organization. It follows a pragmatic ESA based for the organization. So it's more lightweight in a way than FairDOM, but prepares data nicely for publication in, in data repositories. Finally, a newcomer that we are currently in the process of integrating in the uh, plant roadmap is COPO, the Collaborative Plant Omics. It's a data formatting portal. It's not something that you can instantiate in your own organization, but it's more data broker that helps you um, format single data files quite easily to prepare EBI or other uh, publication. So as a perspective, what we want to do in the upcoming years for among us offering for Elixir plant, uh, we want to prepare service bundle. In other words, to bring together tool sets, recommendations, trainings, put all of this on tests and bio tools to outreach, to ease the reuse of the workflows that we have built and on the best practice on how to use them. We want to increase interoperability between the data management toolboxes that I've just presented. And we are going to work on connecting all of those data workflows to analysis and development, and especially in connection with the Galaxy community. On this said, I would like to thank you for listening, and now let's go for questions. Thank you very much. Any questions from attendees? If you do have any, you can use the raise your hand function, and we'll invite you to speak. Um, I don't think any questions have been posted in chat or our panelists can also unmute themselves and ask a question directly if they would like. Uh, hi. Hi, Cyril. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is um, great talk. Thank you for giving it. Um, I, I'm not a plant scientist, but so my questions are linked somehow to human, uh, but uh, I found your talk amazing and I, I'm really keen to see uh, the service bundles that will be dedicated to the plants, to the barges. This is extremely important to allow non bioinformaticians uh, bio to, to, to use these tools. But my question is related to um, to the uh, plant standards and to the um, FADER uh, data portal. Uh, you mentioned that, so my IP, if, if I'm not wrong, it's a standard for the phenotyping of plants. Yes. What I find, again, very interesting in plants and differently from human is that plants are highly influenced by environment, so they cannot move. Uh, therefore, environment uh, is a key 
data point in any analysis. Uh, do we have standards for environment and is our environment data uh, included in these portals? Yes, environment is totally part of my API. As, as you pointed, you cannot uh, assess the behavior of plants without taking into account uh, the environment. The crop ontology that I've pre pre presented allows to a certain level to, uh, to capture environment data. You've got also environmental factors and uh, environmental parameters that are currently handled uh, by MyAPI. And there is going to be an upcoming work in collaboration with um, Emphasis around uh, modeling, plant modeling in the agronomical sense. They have their own standards and there is definitely a connection to make between those standards and MyAPI. But you already got some environment aspect in, uh, in one of the most important things in agriculture, I suppose, is to uh, uh, arrive to a point where plants are adapted to the local environment, to the local uh, rainfall and uh, whatever heat conditions. Uh, either way, I, I don't know to search if I if I have a specific environment. Let's say in Romania, uh, in in a region, it's, it's dry. Uh, and I want to find uh, maize uh, crops. Adapted to dry right. regions, for instance. Sorry? If you want to find a specific variety adapted, for instance, to dry region. Yes, something like yeah. that. You know, uh, just go there and type dry region maize and... <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first way to do things. Uh, what, in fact, what you just described is indeed the, the dream use case we want to be able to answer, but it, it's a complicated one because from experiment, we must pull first environment characterization and uniformization within different experimental networks, and then general uh, description, descriptors of the different varieties. So it's very... Uh, late advanced in the data life cycle. To answer the type of question you have just asked, I would say it's more around uh, plant genetic resources than directly around experiments. Therefore, I would go to something like Eurisco that we have just mentioned. The interesting thing is that within one of the projects we are working on, agent to name it, we are closely collaborating with Eurisco and FIDER will index Eurisco. So not now, but in a couple of years, you'll be able to answer your answer, your question through FIDER. Okay, thank you. Excellent, it's a really good question and a really nice summary of uh, the way forward. Um, I'm gonna take a break now. So we're going to start again at 20 minutes past the hour. Um, let me just uh, reconvene the, the second um, half of this webinar um, and to introduce both Celia and Daniel from Elixir Portugal, who will be telling you, they'll be doing a double act. So Celia will start by telling you more about Elixir Portugal and its plant science activities before Daniel, Daniel will talk more, more about the Elixir Converge plant science use case. So over to you, Celia. Thank you, Andy. So good morning, everybody. I will uh, give you an overview of the activities we have been conducting in the Elixir Portugal. Um, so our node has been a lot dedicated to plant sciences. Uh, I will give uh, this overview of some of the activities, many of them that have been developed in close collaboration with the Elixir uh, whole plant community. And then in the second part of the presentation, Daniel um, will continue the presentation by focusing mainly on training activities, on the engagement with the industry, and finally on the uh, description of the presentation of the plant pilot uh, study in Alexi Converge, in which he's involved. 
But uh, just before starting the presentation, I would just like to add that um, as a plant biologist and a coordinator of the Portuguese um, plant sciences community of Elixir, um, my, one of my roles has been to, to bring plant biologists into Elixir and promote uh, interaction with computer scientists like Daniel present here um, in order to encourage the development of tools and other resources that are so important to enable uh, further progress in the plant sciences and plant breeding specifically and taking, taking advantage of the recent technologies in phenotyping and genotyping that are producing uh, large amounts of data. So I hope this webinar will also contribute to that general uh, goal. So the um, Elixir Portugal that was initially named as Biodata PT uh, is a consortium of 12 partner institutions that are spread across the, the country. It is a small country but we are covering the, the whole country. And uh, among these institutions, we have universities, we have research institutes, and also a biotechnology uh, industry organization, the PBO. Um, that is uh, one organization that brings together uh, most of the companies in the life sciences and biotechnology sector in Portugal. Uh, so, the organization of the Biodata PT is shown here. We have a management board um, in which we have representatives of every partner institution. We have a scientific advisory board with members, both from the academia and industry. We have a board of, di of directors and then the operational infrastructure is composed of the communities in several life science domains including agri-food and forestry, uh, sea and health, among others. Then we have the platforms um, that are transversal to the activities of the communities and provide um, the support, uh, namely in the computing and training uh, activities. And then, of course, we have the services that are provided by the node. I should say also that at uh, the present moment, we have uh, additional institutions that are starting the process of joining the node. So perhaps soon we'll have more than 12 institutions represented in Biodata PT. So regarding the Elixir Plant Sciences community in Portugal, these are the, the partners that compose this community. So it's a relatively small community. Um, and we have these institutions. I'm representing IBET here. Uh, Daniel is from INESCID. And from these institutions, INESCID is the only one that does not conduct research in the plant sciences domain. Uh, but it has been uh, having a very important role in the development of tools and resources together with the plant scientists and acting also uh, as a platform, thus providing support to the underlying infrastructure. So uh, the Portuguese community uh, of plant sciences was formed and became active during the Elixir Accelerate project. So during the implementation phase of Elixir that um, this project started in 2015 and was finished last year. Uh, and we have co-led the plant sciences use case uh, in this project. But within the Portuguese nodes, one of our key use cases has been in the woody plant domain. And this is because uh, in part, uh, many uh, woody plant species are very important in Portugal, uh, economically important, but also they have uh, an important role um, in the environment and also a social role in some parts of the country. Uh, so of course, this is our main interest, but the tools are also extensive to other plant species and together they will contribute to address uh, some major challenges that we are facing today, including the sustainable supply of food and other non-food materials uh, to have a competitive sector um, in the life sciences and environmental protection. 
So as I said, uh, uh, woody plants are um, our main interest and cork oak is a good example. Uh, so cork oak is the national tree of Portugal. Um, over one third of the total area of cork oak forest in the world is located in Portugal. And we are the leading producers of cork. Uh, so in addition to this, as I mentioned, it has also very important ecological role uh, and social uh, relevance as well. So, but in addition to cork oak, we have, of course, uh, other species of interest and uh, forest species like maritime pine and eucalyptus are among them. Uh, so these uh, three uh, species, maritime pine, eucalyptus and cork oak are the most representative in the Portuguese forest. And um, they provide a lot of income to the country and many jobs. So just for you to have an idea, um, some of the largest industries in Portugal largely depend on the supply of raw materials that are provided by these uh, species. And one of those companies, Daniel will talk more about it because we have a collaboration project with them that is funded by Elixir. Uh, so, but other species of interest are also the olive tree, the grapevine that are woody species but also rice, which is a non-woody, but we are also producers of rice in the country. And just as a curiosity, we are the major consumers, uh, consumers of rice in Europe. Uh, so going on to the Portuguese uh, activities within the plant sciences community. Uh, so our objectives and activities um, many of them, as I said, in collaboration with the whole uh, Elixir plant community have, have been to develop and to recommend standards and ontologies uh, for uh, plant data uh, in order to uh, comply with the FAIR principles that Cyril uh, mentioned. Uh, also to develop and implement repositories for plant data, phenotyping and genomic data as well as user-friendly interfaces for their deposition and retrieval. And of course, to provide also uh, annotated and curated plant data sets to the community, uh, together with development uh, of tools for, for plant data analysis. But to ensure that these resources and tools are adopted by the community, we have uh, also made some effort uh, in provision of training on plant data management uh, as an outreach activity. Uh, and also we have engaged with industry uh, through collaboration projects in order to exchange and apply this knowledge that has been generated. So Cyril and Christina already mentioned the MyAPI um, updated version, and this was a major uh, achievement of the plant sciences community during the Accelerate project in which we were actively involved. Uh, I will not go over uh, all the features of the MyAPI because Cyril has already done so, but I would just highlight that one of the improvements of MyAPI was precisely the extension of its scope in order to accommodate the woody plants, woody case, uh, use case. Uh, so a special emphasis was put into um, some attributes that are very relevant for the description of woody plant uh, experiments, namely the identification of plant material. Uh, so um, in addition to these and under, under the ontologies and standards, uh, we have also uh, been involved in the refinement and update of some ontologies uh, to, to have a specific, uh, for instance, three specific traits included in some of these ontologies. And for instance, in the woody plant ontology that we have um, updated together with the French node of Elixir, now includes a number of attributes that are very important to describe um, cork quality, for instance. Uh, 
but also we have um, developed other uh, ontologies, for instance, this plant experimental assay ontology that describes experimental pr uh, procedures and pipelines in plant biology. And so the aim is to, uh, of course, integrate and manage uh, plant experiments, but also to ensure experimental reproducibility and uh, data sharing. And this is one of the uh, services of the node that we are still uh, working on. So uh, these ontologies are in the agro portal on the crop ontology and the plant experimental assay ontology is in bio portal. Um, and they are also indexed in the ontology lookup service that is provided by Elixir. So under the repositories and um, annotated data sets, we have also developed together with the Elixir um, plant community, a Portuguese BRAPI uh, endpoint uh, so, and this was funded by an Elixir staff exchange program that was led by the Netherlands. And so our BRAPI endpoint implements currently 13 BRAPI calls. Uh, it has an underlying SQL database that was reverse engineered from BRAPI specifications. Uh, and because we are, uh, we need to update our database uh, to the latest version of BRAPI, um, we will shift to RDF triple store based in MyAPI ontology in order to provide some uh, flexibility. So this uh, BRAPI endpoint currently includes um, data sets that are manually curated from cork oak, from rice, and from uh, Jotropha culcas, which is the purging nut. But of course, the objective is to populate uh, this endpoint with uh, further data sets from these species and from other species also. Uh, just an important to, to mention also that our um, BRAPI endpoint is one of the endpoints that is feeding data to the FEDER, so the service that Cyril uh, already described, and uh, these was done during the Elixir Accelerate project that, that I previously mentioned and um, funded also by the, an Elixir staff exchange program. So, um, MyAPI, you've heard a lot uh, already about MyAPI. Um, MyAPI is relatively complex standard. So in order to ensure that the community adopts uh, this standard, we have uh, been made in some um, efforts in order to facilitate its use by the users. So we have invested in the development of interfaces for MyAPI submission. Um, so in the initial phase, we have made available a MyAPI as a tab template for use with ISA tools that has been already uh, used in some training activities and is ready to use. But uh, we have also um, contri been contributing to the implementation of MyAPI in uh, different data management platforms that are sometimes preferred by different communities, uh, such as Dataverse that uh, we have already implemented in Portugal, uh, the MyAPI Ferdam Seek that is under development, and an ontology-based MyAPI interface. And this work is, uh, has also been uh, funded, is under development um, through an LXE staff exchange pro program with uh, France, Netherlands, and Belgium. So coming now to the other objectives that we have. So with the Cork Oak DB, which is the Cork Oak genome portable, uh, portal, kinds of join different objectives that we have in our node. So it serves as a repository. It provides uh, notated data sets and also uh, tools for data analysis. Uh, so this um, Core Coke Portugal uh, portal is very important in, uh, it's an important service that provided by the node in Portugal um, because we have already uh, a community of researchers that have been engaged in developing tools to promote research in Cork Oak. We had several, several years ago, 
um, a consortium of uh, researchers that uh, um, released the first transcript on uh, a reference in Core Oak. After that, we have um, we had a dedicated project for the complete uh, sequencing of the genome of Cork Oak that was partially funded by the Cork industry. And so these efforts of the Portuguese community of, of researchers are now showcased in this uh, genome uh, portal of Cork Oak that provides a single entry point to all the available molecular data. Um, it is a, a portal that was uh, developed based on the TRIPAL framework that Daniel can let you know more about that if you are interested. So, um, with the similar objectives, we have also the plant uh, small RNA portal that is under uh, development. So it is an emerging node service. Uh, and this portal incorporates um, an automated pipeline that is the MIR pursuit that is already uh, published. Uh, and this automated workflow allows analysis of small RNA sequencing data with their identification and annotation, and also uh, some gene expression analysis and prediction of small RNA target genes. It also incorporates um, a database that uh, works as a repository of small RNAs that have been either annotated through the use of me pursuit or other small RNAs that are publicly available in uh, the species of our main interest. So now I will uh, hand it over to Daniel that will continue the presentation. Sorry. So I just need to stop sharing. Okay. So, hello everyone. Sorry, I seem to have a, a bit of background noise on my end. I hope it's not too disrupting. Um, so with regard to training activities, we, we have started uh, trying to train people on MyAPI uh, back in 2017. And initially, we, we hosted a, a bring your own data session uh, and had people trying to fill in MyAPI on, on Excel independently on their computers. And to be honest, I, I didn't really like the dynamic of that, of that session. I, I think many people didn't bring their own data. Uh, and we, we were unprepared to provide uh, example data sets. So we didn't delve into it further for, for a few years. And then last year, we were challenged with uh, organizing a, a, a data management plans exercise for, for a workshop that was not really about plants, but still a, a tr transversal issue. And we came up what, with what you see here in, in the the, the picture, so a, a group exercise where people just stick post-its to, to a, a mock canvas, uh, to a canvas uh, based on a mock project. Uh, and we felt that the dynamics of, of this exercise was, was really good. Uh, and people in, really were engaged and trying to, to discuss things. Uh, and so we, we, we tried to transpose this, this same dynamic to, to the plant's use case. And later last year, we, we hosted the first uh, MyAPI uh, hands-on workshop where we gave people a, a, a pre-prepared data set and a, a sheet to fill in by hand in groups. Uh, and the, the methodology really worked. I, I felt people were, were very engaged in this. So we, we repeated it early uh, this year in February, just before the, the COVID crisis started. So it was actually my, my last travel to, to Paris to, to do this with Cyril. Uh, and we are looking forward to doing this uh, further, but now, of course, COVID means we can't do this uh, in person, which kind of uh, defeats some of the, the, the purpose of having a, a dynamic group exercise, but we have been experimenting uh, on our ready for biodata management courses. Uh, we have already uh, done online versions and we have come up with a format that, that works reasonably well 
despite the lack of uh, human contact. And we are going to, to try and, and bring the, the same uh, system to, to the plant use case as well. So we, we are planning on hosting more uh, MyAPI uh, data management uh, exercises now on a virtual platform. So with regard to the industry, this, this collaboration with the Navigator company kind of came about as, as a way of trying to address one of the problems we have in Elixir problem, uh, Portugal, which is reaching to the people that actually have phenotyping data uh, to try and, and, and populate our BRAPI endpoint with, with data sets. And uh, we, we realized that many of the, the people that have uh, a lot of data are not uh, academics, are, are in the industry. So Navigator company has access to uh, thousands and thousands of tree specimens across uh, Portugal because they, uh, they have access to or own forests to, to, to collect wood for uh, paper production. And they have, of course, their own improvement programs and, and they collect phenotyping data and generate genotyping data across uh, the, the whole country. And so they have a wealth of data that, that would be uh, very important to, to share with the research community uh, at large. So we, we uh, heard about the Elixir Knowledge Exchange scheme and we, we thought it would be a good idea to, to approach the Navigator company uh, to see if they were interested in, in, in a collaboration of this sort where they would uh, kind of provide uh, example data sets they wouldn't mind sharing, so wouldn't violate company secrecy. Uh, and uh, we would help them organize and, and annotate the, those data sets according to, to the standards we've been developing in Elixir. And to our surprise, they accepted, and it's now an ongoing project. It was uh, delayed a couple of months due to the COVID crisis, so it was supposed to start early this year and we had to, to postpone it, but we're now. Uh, Go, going about it in a virtual collaboration as well. Uh, and it's, uh, we, we've now received the, the first example data sets from them. We, we're trying to, to map them to, to BRAPI. So uh, I think this, this will be a, a, a very successful and fruitful collaboration. So yeah, I already mentioned this. <clears throat> We are now looking at another important industry collaboration. So it's, it's not actually submitted to the Elixir Knowledge Exchange Scheme yet, but it's going to be submitted. We are now debating the, uh, whether it, it makes sense to, or, or how it makes more sense to fund this because the, these uh, exchange schemes were originally geared towards funding travel. Uh, uh, and that's not something that makes sense in the COVID world. So we're trying to, to figure out how, how to organize the project in, in a post-COVID world. But this is a, a very important uh, industry collaboration as well. So uh, Phenospecs is, is one of the leading companies in, in uh, automated plant phenotyping solutions. And so they provide everything from, from the, the sensors to the, the computer software. So they have full process automation and they have their own software. Uh, and it happened by, serendipity that we, we trained back in, in Paris in February, one of the, the leading uh, developers of this company. He came to, to learn about MyAPI and he was very interested in, in the prospect of, of making his information system MyAPI compliant and able to export data in BRAPI calls. And this was obviously something that we, the Elixir plant community was, was very interested in because this would mean that we have uh, 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 a system that already produces MyAPI compliant data from the start. So uh, during data collection, the data will be already organized uh, in a MyAPI compliant way. And this will address the, the problem of, of, of people actually having to organize their own data. So this, this would be an ideal partnership and, and we are looking forward to, to starting with this project. So the company is still very much interested despite the, the limitations imposed by COVID. So we are looking forward to this. And finally, 
with regard to, to Converge, so a, a brief introduction to, to the, the Converge structure. There's uh, uh, a work package one where, uh, which is tasked with forming a data management expert network, a work package do, two devoted mainly to training, work package three uh, devoted to developing a data management toolkit, work package four devoted to dissemination, impact, uh, and industry. Uh, work package five, that's about the use cases, and this includes the plant pilot study uh, that I, I'm going to talk to you about. So it's one of the use cases, uh, the first wave use cases for, for this work package. And then work package six is project management. Now uh, recently approved uh, more work packages devoted to the COVID use case, but not originally part of the project. So if you look at the, the original project, there's a, a, a sort of segmented view of what each work package is supposed to do. But what is actually happening is that uh, the, the project is aptly named because we are converging all, uh, at least the operational work packages are all converging uh, in, in around the, the data management toolkit. So it was supposed to be uh, mainly the, the task of work package three, but what we have uh, found out is that to, to form the, the toolkit, we need the, the, the expertise of the data management expert network. Uh, we need to include training materials uh, and we need to include the use cases as well. So we are gathering uh, input and, and knowledge for, from all these work packages, but the, the reverse is also true. So the toolkit will also contribute to to the, the other work packages. So work package one was also tasked with drafting data management best practices, and, and they realized that the best place to do this is inside the data management toolkit. So coming back to the, the plant use case, what we realized uh, for, for, for the, the work package five is that what makes sense is also that the, the, the use cases and the plant use case in specific are contemplated already intrinsically in the data management toolkit. So what is a data management toolkit, you might ask? So a toolkit is not necessarily just a set of tools. It's more a methodology to address a problem. So this is a research data management toolkit. It, it seeks to address problems pertaining to, to research data management. Uh, and the, the goals are first to list common research data management problems and the best practice solutions to address them, to list relevant tools and resources, to list training materials and examples, and, and then to actually put these together into assemblies. So that would be toolkits proper. Uh, so how you would combine different resources and, and materials to, to actually manage your data from start to finish. Uh, and we are going about it in, in a flexible way. So we have uh, several paradigms of navigation. You can, as you see here in the picture, you can uh, approach the, the, the toolkit by stage of data management, but you can also search for your domain. So there's already uh, a placeholder for the, the plant use case. Bear in mind, this is still very much under construction. As you can see here in the picture, there's a, a note saying, saying it's under construction. We, we expect it to be a, a finalized first draft by the end of the year, uh, early January at, at the latest. But so we have several ways of navigating, as, as I was saying, by stage, domain, by problem, uh, and even by persona. So if you are a, a data steward, if you are a researcher, etc. And the goal of the, the plant pilots is essentially to apply this uh, research data management toolkit to produce uh, example or, or uh, let's say, demonstrator data management plans for plant research projects. Essentially, it will bring together the things we have already been discussing. So covered in, in Christina and Cyril's presentation, the, the whole plant infrastructure, how, how we want to uh, have tools to analyze data, how we want to, to have standards to, to publish the data in a fair way, how we want to make data findable. The, the data management plan should bring all that together into a, a, a single document, a single uh, 
arrangement of, of tools and resources to to enable researchers to manage data from a project. So currently we, we have mostly done the, the collection of user stories from the plant community. So these, these are a way to, to, to gather information of what the problems and, and the, the needs of the community are. Uh, and we are now in the process of contributing to, to uh, developing the, the toolkit to ensure that the, those user stories are addressed in the toolkit so that they are well documented there are solutions and and, and resources listed that pertain to, to the use case of the plants in a simple view the the workflow for plant phenotyping data is something like this so it's really very much about my api there there are issues to, to address before my api so whether you have the trait in crop ontology or not whether you know the genotype or not how you describe it but then it's around uh, describing your data with my API. And then there's a number of options that are growing as we develop more and more easy to use uh, my API interfaces for, for data submission. And then there's also the, the option of marking up with bioschemas to ensure findability, which is a, a relevant aspect. And this is also something we are working on in an Elixir implementation study. As for genotyping data, uh, again, my API comes to the forefront because it's key that at least the biological materials be described in the same way in both genotyping and phenotyping experiments so that they can be crossed. And then there's a, a process of uh, using the European Nucleotide Archive, European Variation Archive to, to submit the data. And Alternatively, the option of, of depositing in an organism-specific database, which can also be marked up with Bioskin. So this is a well-drafted uh, workflow, but mostly, if you noticed, for data publication. So it's something we still have to do to address points of the data lifecycle other than publication. Mainly, how to collect data and process it and analyze it in a way that, that's also conducive to, to my API compliance upon publication. And nicely, the, the, the collaboration we, we are starting with PhenoSpecs will address this at least for uh, people that use automated uh, solutions from PhenoSpecs, but obviously we need to, to address the, the problem in a broader perspective for people that still uh, collect data by hand uh, and for woody plants which is the, the main case in portugal uh, that tends to be so we don't have automated uh, rigs for for collecting data from plants in, in forests because it would have to be really huge system to, to do that and we are also working this is not specifically within converge but as the plant community as a whole we are also working in improving the usability sources so in making sure that we have really easy to use my API interfaces so, so we, we already addressed this and Cyril has already covered this in part so working with Ferdom working with Dataverse and other solutions to make it really easy and simple for people to, to submit my API data so this is our institutional thanks our, our uh, personal thanks are, are too extensive to to list in a single slide so we, we thank all of the elixir plant community and beyond uh, both national and and at all the other nodes excellent many thank you many thanks daniel and celia for that comprehensive presentation about um, Elixir Portugal and also the plant science activities in Converge. Just to confirm that the toolkit that Daniel presented will be open to everyone to use. So it doesn't matter if you're a member of Elixir or not. Once it's publicly released and launched, then you'll be able to use it for your research wherever you're based. Um, and we're expecting that will be in early 2021 when it's released. So we have time for some questions. There are some in the chat. So I will read this out to you, Daniel and Celia. Um, it's a question about impact. So I think people have found interesting the way Elixir Portugal is, is one of the priorities about trying to support local industry. So is it possible for you to quantify the impact on industry of the Portuguese data infrastructure? And if you can offer a perspective, and then after that, I will also invite Corinne um, from the Elixir Hub, who is Elixir's impact expert to give a perspective as well. Well, I can try to answer that. 
it's a difficult question indeed. <laughs> we, we cannot really quantify at this stage the impact um, in industry, but um, I can tell you that uh, these activities um, related to cork oak, the, the release of the genome portal, for instance, that was uh, officially released only a few months ago, has had a, a high impact in the research community. Uh, so, as I said, we have a lot of groups um, doing research in Cork Oak, and we have already uh, some papers published in which they refer to the use of the genome portal. So, yes, the, the, the answer is yes, um, it has had a, an impact mainly in the research community. But um, I have to say that uh, industry uh, associated to, to Cork production uh, has been also engaged in, in some of these activities and they have, for instance, funded uh, the genome project of Cork Oak. So they are um, aware of the, of the importance, but um, it, it is also important to say that their role in the industry has been up to now mainly uh, to buy the cork to the, to the producers. So they have not um, implemented an improvement program of their own, but we know that very recently they have engaged also in uh, research in cork oak, namely in the resilience to climatic change. So I, I am certain that the portal will be useful also um, for that purpose. But uh, at this moment, I cannot quantify really the impact in the industry. If, if I may add, sorry, Daniel. Yep. With regard to our, our collaboration with, with the Navigator company, so it's just recently started. It's, it, we don't have a measurable impact yet because we're just starting, but our, our hope is that this, this will be a, a foothold uh, into a, a, a broader relation with, with the industry, in, not only the paper production industry, but others, because it's, it's really a, a, a one of the largest uh, companies related to, to uh, woody plants in Portugal. Excellent. Corinne? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it, it's great that this question is asked, actually, because Portugal is leading on one of these uh, staff exchange projects that we have mentioned several times this morning. And I have put the link in the chat, so you're welcome to have a look. And in particular, at the beginning, the main activities were to look at things close to home, you know, the impact of data management, the training aspect, data management plan aspects. But last week, Elixir Portugal ran a really interesting uh, impact workshop, and I was a guest on it, and Daniel was there as well. And in fact, I was in one of the uh, groups that discussed a portal, uh, I think it was the, the, the Core Oak portal, and how to measure the impact of that, how to find evidence of the use of it, and is it used by industry, how can we track this, etc. So all that to say that Portugal is very active, and I have no doubt that in the coming months or years, we will have a lot of evidence of the impact in the research community, but also in the industry. So well done, Portugal, you're on your way, <laughs> definitely. Thank you, Corinne. Um, I'm going to jump now to a question that has been posted in the Q&A. So this comes from Ramona. I think we'll have time for one more question before we move on. Um, and this is an interesting question because it's really about capacity building. Um, so Ramona mentions how agriculture is a large part of the Romanian economy. They have very large farms um, and also individual bioinformatics resources as well but there's a gap in capacity. So lack of skills or specialists with those skills. And she wonders about the opportunities um, in Elixir for collaboration on capacity building projects. If I may, I, I will answer that one directly, Ramona. So some of the services that you've heard about today, the resources like FedEx and BRAPI and MyAPI and some of the resources that are run individually from Slovenia and Portugal, they're open for use from anyone. So you can already access those. You can access the training courses online and face-to-face -face events through the test portal as well. But some of the other projects that we've mentioned, things like the staff exchange scheme, to do that, you need to be a member of Elixir, and that would be the easiest way of helping to support the capacity. So, and that's what many countries that have recently joined Elixir have done. They've become a member, and then they've been able to take part in the knowledge exchange schemes and the staff exchange schemes. Their training experts have worked closely with the training experts across other Elixir countries, and they've 
been actively involved in the plant science community, receiving funding from Elixir and through our EU projects to be able to do capacity building activities. So there are some opportunities that are open to Romania without being a member, but to get funding to work on these projects like the staff exchange, it is something that you would need to be a, a member for. Um, and these are the types of messages that we also try to relay to the, to the um, ministry when we work with them as well. So hopefully that's answered your question. I'm going to thank now Daniel and Celia for their um, um, Daniel and Celia for their talk, and I'll ask now Dragos if he can upload his slides to give a, a national perspective about okay. some of the activities taking place. Thank you. So, hello everyone. I would like to congratulate uh, RCBI for organizing. Uh, this series of uh, webinars in collaboration with Elixir uh, Network. It was a very a great experience uh, today to hear uh, um, to hear uh, opinions and uh, uh, different uh, experience of from uh, Elixir Networks from different uh, countries. And I would like to thank Bogdan Rehutsev from RCBI for inviting me to speak uh, at this webinar dedicated to collaboration in plant sciences. The title of uh, joint presentation is Exploring Genetic Diversity in uh, Forest Species and Annual Crops with uh, High Probability of Sequencing. Uh, Mihai will present the results on annual crops. Um, and next, I would like to focus on uh, forest species. So, Romania is. Uh, Romania forest, forest genetic resources uh, harbor uh, high genetic diversity. Although human impact during the last uh, two centuries has strongly affected the forest ecosystem composition and uh, structure. Uh, the high genetic diversity was mostly revealed by uh, chloroplast molecular markers for several very important forest species like oaks. In the present slide, we see a very high uh, genetic diversity in oak populations in uh, Romania. But also we can see at the, across the Balkan Peninsula, a very high genetic diversity. As well as next, we will see a very clear phylogeographic uh, structure in another uh, forest species, Horbin, Carpinus betulus, which also holds a very high genetic diversity across the entire Balkans. The discovered neutral genetic diversity data provide important information about historical population processes, such as post-glacial migration routes, but also genetic diversity data that we acquired are very useful in the management and the conservation activities of forest genetic resources, as uh, this information, this data can inform on the prioritization of population for conservation and sustainable management. And in the future, it can uh, help to assist uh, migration. So, but with the progress uh, in the last decade of next generation sequencing techniques, New opportunities and tools arise uh, for uh, forest, uh, forest genetics. So with the NGS techniques, uh, we have opportunity to explore uh, evolutionary processes in forest species, which are non-model organisms with very long generation time and with la very large genomes. One of the major goal of uh, forest genomics uh, is to explore the distribution of adaptive diversity in evolutionary context. The adaptive diversity have, has played a major role in the response of forest genetics uh, to climate change. However, capturing uh, the signal of local adaptation still remain a very challenging task in forest species. Um, next, I would like to present uh, our results on the development and how uh, the development of genomic resources can contribute to explore neutral and adaptive genetic uh, variation in, uh, for, in a forest species like uh, silver fir, 
So uh, silver pearl is a widespread uh, European conifer. It is a keystone species of many mountain forest ecosystems, but the marginal uh, peripheral silver fir populations at southern edge of the distribution are expected to be mostly affected by clim climate change. Due to their uh, small population sizes, fragmented distribution and their uh, biogeographical uh, position. So it has been observed uh, in the last uh, decades increasing mortality of silver fir populations located in uh, different uh, parts of species distribution range, as for example, as for example in the southwestern Carpathians in Romania, but also in the Spanish Pyrenees and in the southeastern part of France in the Mont Ventoux. So the approach that we applied was to uh, develop uh, genomic resources and we use the next uh, workflow. So based on the uh, de novo assembly of silver fair transcriptome, we developed two sets of multiplexes, which uh, have been used. For example, it was uh, used in uh, new research activities such as investigation, population structure, and demographic history in silver fur populations from Italy and Eastern Europe. Additionally, we used 12 transcriptome uh, to discover SNPs located in uh, candidate genes involved in draw stress. And these uh, uh, SNPs uh, have been used to design a, SNP, a new SNP array which has been used with uh, CASP genotyping technology. And this SNP array was used uh, to test for uh, evidence of local ad adaptation across 10 altitudinal gradients. And the final set uh, was uh, included uh, 273 SNPs within 177 candidate genes related to draw stress. Another study we focused uh, on an entire species distribution range. Uh, so we focus on uh, European beach Fagus sylvatica, and we, uh, the target was to explore adaptive genetic variation and on entire species distribution range. So, and we focus on the candidate genes involved in phenology or in stress response. So the final data set was uh, 270 SNPs located in 142 candidate genes. And uh, we found that uh, the distribution of uh, genetic diversity across the range of European uh, beach reflects both uh, biogeographical history and adaptive processes. So to take hope messages from uh, our uh, genomic genetic data uh, is that NGS techniques uh, represent now a solution and a necessity for uh, exploring adaptive genetic diversity and evolutionary processes in forest ecosystems. Ongoing to climate change uh, highlights the importance of studying adaptive genetic variation in forest species and uh, the knowledge of loach under selection combined with the prediction of future climate may help uh, to inform uh, on uh, to inform decision about assisted migration and uh, uh, to adapt uh, no, uh, new forest management so next i would like to present uh, the networks that our institute uh, participate and is involved so we, our institute uh, is member of the Evolfin network, which stayed from evolution of trees as drivers of terrestrial biodiversity. And uh, the target of uh, this network is to improve understanding of forest ecosystems uh, by linking genomics, genetics, ecology, and evolutionary studies, and also to promote the application of genetics and genomics in breeding and conservation activities. And uh, for example, next week, uh, Evoltree will organize uh, a series of uh, trainings uh, focused on a polygenic uh, adaptation. Another network that, uh, that our institute uh, is involved is uh, the Afrogen network. 
uh, which uh, aims uh, cross-border research activities on studying adaptation processes in alp alpine forest ecosystem. And also we are, our institute we participate in, in some cost actions uh, like G-Bike uh, cost action, which is focused to in integrate genetic and evolutionary knowledge into conservation planning policies and uh, to, uh, which promote uh, cross-border management and uh, long-term monitoring programs. And just, uh, just a few uh, uh, short information about uh, ongoing national, bilateral, and uh, European uh, projects that we are involved uh, now. Thank you for your attention. So I would like to uh, please, uh, Mikhail, continue with our presentation. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I must say that I've been in touch with Bogdan Mirauza for quite a long time, but somehow I did, we didn't have the chance to really interact and present my, my data on, on maize and see all the bioinformatics that we are doing here in, in Cluj-Napoca in the heart of Transylvania. Uh, thank you also to the Elixir network. It's uh, it's something that we we, sh we should really get uh, we should be become affiliated. So I will also try to bring my support to the to the ministry to to see how we can uh, pay the <laughs> the fee and become a full member. Uh, okay, maize in Romania. Uh, it's diversity. Uh, it's huge. It's, it's been here as a crop since the 17th century. So it had quite a lot of time to, to develop and to, to develop local, uh, local inbred lines. And as you can see, we, we now have uh, over 2000 inbred lines. So these are homozygous lines that I have been able to put together through a network of collab collaborations, mainly with the agricultural research stations in Romania but also with uh, the, the researchers in, uh, in, in Belgrade. And I, co I closely collaborate with the uh, Ginseng Lies Laboratory at China Agricultural Uni University, mainly for data generation and uh, bioinformatics. This is just a, a small sample of the diversity that we have here in, in the Balkan area. I think here are just only 20, 20 inbred lines that I'm showing you. So you can imagine how a panel of 2,000 inbred lines would look like. So the effort that I'm coordinating is to, to genotype by sequence uh, these 2,236 uh, inbred lines. And you can see where they are coming from. Uh, most of them are from Romania, but I have a big chunk from Moldova, uh, which holds actually the, the genetic diversity of the former Soviet Union, because this was really the the breeding grounds of their uh, uh, breeding programs and some inbred lines from uh, the former Yugoslavia. Just briefly, because my, sh my, my talk will be short, five to 10 minutes at uh, the most. Uh, this is what we do. We take the, we take the samples, we pull them in, in 96 uh, samples per library, and then we use the Illumina HiSec uh, X uh, sequencing to do the pair and sequencing to a very low coverage, but still enough to give us these uh, over 1.4 1 million, 1 million uh, SMPs. So after we get the raw data, we do the fast P to clean the, the data, and then we use BWA mem to map to the B73 reference genome. Yes, we are, we are lucky that we have a reference genome, which is quite, uh, quite good. Uh, then, of course, SAM tools to do the sorting and indexing, and GATK3, uh, SMP, and indel calling, as well as uh, marking the duplicates and removing them. So, after we apply all these filters, we do our analysis based on uh, 1.4 million SNPs. Uh, we do the Beagle imputation, and the resulting uh, VCF file, uh, we process it in three different ways. So the first analysis would be a PCA, principal component analysis, analysis then uh, an NGA3, and the population structure using a mixture. This is a, a small movie showing you how these 2,200 inbred lines look like in 3D space on three principal components. 
In red, you see the international standards, international inbred lines or so-called elite inbred lines that are currently used in, molecular, in uh, breeding programs. And in, uh, in orange or yellow, you see inbred lines that originate from local populations of Romania. And as you could see at the beginning, uh, most of the inbred lines coming from local populations cluster in these uh, in the, the points, the pointy ends of these clusters. And okay, when we do the neighbor joining tree analysis, this uh, clustering of the inbred lines coming from local populations. Uh, come, come front, uh, come in front again uh, with uh, these deeply rooted uh, subclusters that are not related in any way to the international standards. Pinpointing again the, the diversity, the genetic diversity that we have here in the in Romania in the Balkan region. And the third way to look at the data was using the admixture results. And uh, here I'm just showing you the K analysis from K3 to K8, but we went further. And the, the interesting thing here as well, local inbred lines group together. So this, this, cluster, here, this cluster here only uh, is about 200 inbred lines that cluster together no matter how uh, we tell the software to group, group the lines. So I would really get to, okay, this is, before I get to the take home message, I just want to show you uh, the different story that the chloroplast and mitochondria are telling, telling us. Uh, these, these are the same two, over 2000 inbred lines looking at the mitochondrial uh, genome and mitochondria and chloroplast. You can see that the diversity, at least in the, in the plastid, in the chloroplast uh, uh, analysis is quite low compared to the, to the nucleus, although the mitochondria is roughly the same, but not the same uh, shape of the cluster. What, what this is telling us is that the, the cytoplasm, uh, which holds this, the, the nuclei, is not uh, so diverse. So the maternal, the maternal uh, progenitors uh, were, so the, the, genetic, the genetic pool of the maternal material is uh, lower than the overall genetic diversity. So really the take home message would be that we have quite a genetic diversity here in Southeast Europe that is worth investigating forward. And we are really interested in these uh, inbred lines coming from open pollinated varieties because Romania, even now uh, it has uh, regions where hybrids have not entered. We really have this uh, stubborn peasants that uh, cultivate their, their uh, material that is passed on from one generation to another. And this has led really to the uh, pres preserving important genes in those areas that we believe could be brought back into breeding efforts nowadays when we, we are lacking, we, we are dealing with a lack of diversity worldwide. And with that, I will, I will thank you. And I will take questions. Thank you, Mihai and Dragos, for both of those talks. Really, really interesting, summarizing your, your excellent research taking place and also the collaborations that you're working on as well. So questions for Mihai and Dragos. Hi, if I may, I have two questions. So one is for Mihai Dragos, but also for Alexir Portugal. Um, because this relationship with the industry is important uh, also to show that um, what we are doing is relevant and also to de further develop the science. Um, how is this happening right now in Romania? And if uh, there is any way to benchmark what's being done in, uh, in Portugal and uh, apply the same secret receipt to other countries? In a, so yeah, first I would say how, how is the interaction with industry in Romania? Uh, how is the interaction with the forest management in Romania? Uh, Dragos, you had a very good question at one point uh, relate uh, asking uh, how is ge how genetics can be applied in tracing 
the three th tracing the three origin. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, it was a little bit confusing with my question, but for, yeah, how is this relationship with the industry? I I can answer that, Bogdan, uh, as far as maize is concerned. So now I'm collaborating with these agricultural research stations, which are not really commercial entities, but they do produce hybrid seed and they try to uh, compete with the big seed producers in the future. The, the data that we are generating, the genetic data are helping them a lot and they're very happy now. They have their first hybrids uh, being tested for three years for consistency of, uh, of characters and then they will patent them. And uh, they, are, they were really storing their seeds uh, uh, just, just uh, and, and working with just a few inbred lines. But now that I show them all the, the genetic diversity that it holds, they, they, are, they have already started doing crosses in the field. And I'm sure they will come out with competitive hybrids to the seed companies. So far, we are not interacting with the seed companies. We haven't heard from them. And honestly, I'm not interested as of now to, to work with them. So related to forest sector, so the for, National Forest Service uh, follows strict, uh, some strict normatives, which, uh, which they should follow. So uh, on the op, over on the one hand, we have uh, data uh, that should be implemented uh, in the future, but we should uh, inform uh, which will be, be the benefits for the Forest National Service. So maybe we are lacking to, to make this information fully available in terms of uh, some uh, normatives. To be implemented. But we, for example, uh, in oak species, uh, which uh, uh, the oak species uh, have been mostly affected by uh, human impacts in the last uh, two centuries. And we have a clear uh, phylogeographic pattern. And uh, this pattern can help to delineate uh, some uh, zone of transfers. So, for example, you will not be allowed allow to transfer seed material from one genetic uh, structure to another based on the chloroplast uh, results, genetic data. So uh, we maybe in the future, uh, yes, our aim is to implement uh, in uh, some uh, regulations uh, that will be followed by uh, national forest services. Thank you, Dragos. Um, Daniel, did you have anything you wanted to add from a Portuguese perspective here or not? Uh, so I, I, I can't say that the, there's a recipe to follow in terms of engaging with the industry. I think with, with the Navigator company, we were just fortunate that some of the researchers are, are uh, colleagues uh, of people working in, in, in academia. And so the, there's a personal connection there that, that, that served as a bridge. Uh, it's it's really more down to to making a bridge through personal connections than, than following a, a recipe for engagement. Yeah, I mean, I, I can just add as well from because obviously we have an overview of the activities of all of the Elixir nodes. And when somebody asks me how to construct an Elixir node that is relevant for local needs, I always go back to the example of Portugal because it's so tightly focused around a strong part of the Portuguese bioeconomy. And I think it is a really good message that the Romanian community needs to think about. Ultimately, if you want to join Elixir, you need to jointly with us help convince the ministry about the benefits of why they should invest in a national data infrastructure. And so we discussed some of this in the human data session. If there's lots of large scale genome, human population projects being funded, you need the infrastructure to be able to support those. And I think it's the same on plant sciences, whether it's for forest species or maize or other crops. Um, if that's a really important part of the Romanian economy um, and the data that are being generated from the research projects, they need to be stored. You need to have data management experts to be able to train other researchers to access these. So they're very, very strong messages that we need to continue to get across to the, to the ministry. So, yeah. 
Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. And then at the very end, I will invite Bogdan to make a short announcement on behalf of RSBI. So we have time for one more question from either panelists or the attendees. One second. Uh, so Dragos mentioned a question uh, before, and I find this extremely, extremely relevant uh, because there are significant uh, issues related to tracing uh, trees. Where was the tree cut? Uh, and I would ask um, uh, uh, maybe Daniel uh, if there is such a thing in place using genomics or any molecular biology techniques to help tracing uh, tree origin. I think okay. this. Is okay, I can do maybe uh, to add uh, some detail. For example, you in Portugal you have a uh, 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 cork. I think you would be very interested to, to trace the origin of uh, the cork oak that is used in the market or it is available in the market. Because, if, for example, in France, they succeeded to trace the barrels of France uh, oak origin. So they developed a snip array that succeeded to identify that that barrel comes from a French oak and not from the Eastern. Uh, of populations. So I thought maybe, uh, did you succeed, for example, to develop tools with or based on molecular markers that will allow you to trace uh, cork oak of Portugal origin? Maybe I can give you some ideas um, because in, um, as far as I know, um, there is no project um, having that objective. But I should say that the cork industry uh, many times uses um, agglomerates of cork instead of um, uh, cork planks, intact cork planks. So those intact planks are used in, the, in some industry, uh, namely in the champagne um, industry. But uh, many of the, the cork uh, stoppers that, are, that is the main uh, product from the cork industry are um, uh, manufactured using a very different variety of corks that have a lesser quality and they are joined together and um, so in that case maybe it is a bit difficult to have such a, a project in place um, but as far as I know uh, there has been no, no um, effort in that uh, direction. For example I that uh, with Bogdan. So in Romania, would, we would be very interested to develop uh, tools that will allow us to trace uh, illegal uh, wood cutting. For example, in Romania, we have uh, some uh, uh, some difficult situation that uh, uh, there are illegal woods uh, on the roads. And uh, we would like to, with molecular tools, tools if it's available to find the origin of uh, that wood. And uh, another question would be, also we would like to use in the forest sector to trace the forestry productive material. Because in uh, south, southern Romania, we have this uh, problem that the masting years uh, in oak species are uh, uh, very rare, one in, so one in seven or 10 years, we have a masting uh, year with a lot of seeds. And the foresters have a very big uh, difficult situation. Uh, they are pushed by the National Forest Service uh, to plant trees, but they don't have seeds. So they, uh, and they import, uh, uh, so they bring seeds from uh, different locations, which are not genetically compatible with their uh, populations. And uh, so we would like in the future to check if the uh, seeds comes from a uh, local population, which is the population and from how many trees uh, originate that uh, seed loss. Because uh, foresters used to collect seeds from five uh, or a very small number of trees. But in order to keep in the number of, uh, uh, and to keep the genetic diversity, we have to ensure that the foresters collect from uh, at least uh, 30, 50 uh, trees, different trees. 
So we can, uh, and with molecular markers, we can apply this and we can check if the foresters uh, have uh, collected from enough number of trees. So this would be the future di directions that we can apply in the forest sector of molecular tools in the forestry sector, for example. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just add that in the case of Corcoke, I don't think that there's an economic need to trace okay. the, the, the trees to Portugal because all the trees are in Portugal anyway. So we have 50% of the world production. It's mm -hmm. not like we struggle to, to trace them back to us. Well, not exactly because we have some, some, uh, we import also cork from Morocco and um, I think yeah. mainly from. Yeah, I, but I, I mean, there's not a strong pressure for yeah. not importing cork, cork from Morocco because we already have su such a, a, a large share of the production. That there's really no strain on, on, on mixing with Spain or Moroccan cork. Uh, it is not the same situation as in France because they were invaded by. Eastern Europe uh, oak barrels, and they so they succeeded to develop a molecular tool that will uh, allow them to trace uh, the uh, French oak uh, barrels. Mm -hmm. Very good notes in it. It's a fascinating area using molecular tools to trace species. So it's 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 very interesting. I think what we're going to do now is let Bogdan have a minute to summarize. Um, and make a statement on behalf of RSBI before I, I have to close the event. So Bogdan, over to you. Uh, not a long statement. It's just that we are going to continue discussions uh, about um, what's our future interaction with Elixir and also to try to address some of the uh, question answers related to how to further develop plant science in uh, Romania. There were some answers in the chat. so. We're going to try to, to, to see if uh, we can bring solutions to any of those uh, and uh, therefore have a, a larger meeting in um, end of this month. Uh, it will be an RSBI general, general assembly, but the, the non-RSBI members are, uh, will be invited to participate uh, most likely. Uh, yeah, so that's the announcement. So if you will receive an email, don't be surprised. Okay, thank you, Bogdan. So I'd just like to finish by thanking our speakers for their presentations and also being able to take part in the discussion as well. I'd like to thank, uh, thank the attendees for joining and I hope that you've found um, these talks useful. I know that I have, they've been very interesting and informative. Um, and I'd also like to thank the organizers. So that's colleagues in the Elixir Hub who have organized these series of three webinars but especially Bogdan and his colleagues in uh, RSBI, uh, because the events wouldn't have been possible without your direct help, Bogdan, and your colleagues at RSBI. So from planning the agendas through to um, putting the, the speakers together, through to communicating. So it's been a real pleasure working with you. And um, my final message to everyone is that we would really like to continue to work with the Romanian research community. There's lots of opportunities. You've only heard of some of them throughout these three webinars, but I hope that it's given you a good overview um, of what you could get from formally engaging in Elixir. And it could be a long journey. It could take a number of years before the ministry eventually um, changes its mind. But the best way of doing that is to work closely together to build a strong scientific case in Romania and to reach out to us from the Elixir Hub because we're happy to help you on this journey as well. So good luck and um, we'll hope to stay in touch with you all. Thank you.